Come on, everybody. You guys that have songs like that, that like you have no idea what the words are. And so, or maybe you have, you know, like one line, don't stop believing. And you don't know, so you just like keep repeating that one thing. Don't stop. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm the only one, apparently. Uh, open up uh, these programs here. Uh, we're starting, a, or actually we started a series called Life's Greatest Hits last week. Uh, and in these programs, you can uh, find some notes to follow along today if you need an extra copy or a pen or a Bible, raise your hand. We've got some people that can pass it around to you. Uh, And by the way, if I have not had the pleasure of meeting you yet, my name is Tim. I'm one of the pastors here at Cross Current. Um, So uh, uh, several years ago, um, my wife, Lindsay, and I, we had this conversation with somebody at the church we were attending at the time. And uh, all I can remember from the conversation is that we were, we were sharing with this person, rather enthusiastically, I might add, about Jesus. We were just talking about our faith, and we were talking about uh, just the prayers that God had been answering and the things that God had been doing in our life, and we are talking about it with all this passion and excitement and joy. And, uh, and you know, we... we we saw this like smirk kind of develop on this person's face, and, and I, I expected that, that this person would respond kind of in kind, that they'd be like, amen, right? Or like high five or something, or that's awesome. But what this person said totally threw me off guard. What they said was, are you a new believer? And that's, if you don't know what that means, that's a lingo for, did you just start following Jesus? Are you a new Christian? And it totally threw me up, threw me off guard. I kind of like, kind of like stepped back and like, wait, what? And in fact, uh, in, in fact, we we sort of were. We had been. We had, Lindsay and I were were relatively new Christians. We 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 had been Christians only for like one or two years, and so we're like, yeah, I guess so. And this person said, like, yeah, I thought so. I was the same way when I was a new believer. And that was kind of the end of the conversation. We're like, okay. And we just walked away. And honestly, we walked away feeling a little disheartened. And we walked away feeling a little confused and frustrated. Because how I don't know, you know, she might have had some other kind of intention, but at least how I received it, how it felt was that she was kind of saying, like, oh, how cute. The new Christian's getting excited about Jesus. Come and look how adorable this is, you guys. Well, you better enjoy it because it's all downhill from here. <laughs> all right, but that's kind of how it felt. And so Lindsay and I, we walked away just kind of talking like, what? Really? Is that really how it is? Is this as good as it's going to get? We're like one year in, two years in, we're excited about Jesus. And what do we expect from here? It's just going to go, yeah, pfft. Is it just going to become dry? Is that passion just going to go away? Is, is this as strong and as, as vigorous and as passionate as our faith is going to become? Is it just downhill the longer we follow Jesus and the longer we live life? And all those years ago, Lindsay and I walked away just saying, no, we refuse to believe that. And we still take that stand today. We refuse to believe that that's true. However, I will admit that uh, from that point up until this point, uh, I, I will say that there are many, many, many times and seasons in life where uh, the journey of faith is just hard. Would you guys agree with me that there are times that it is just a struggle that it's hard. We experience crises of faith and doubts and fears and what some might call a dry spell of faith where that fire of uh, uh, fire for Christ is just not as big and roaring. It just kind of feels like we're just like fanning the flame, like, come on, right? And we're just exhausted. And so what I want to talk to you guys about this morning, the title of this this morning is Don't Stop Believing. What I want to talk to you about this morning is how do you keep your faith in moments like that? Right? We all we all are going to go through them. What how do we keep ourselves from getting stuck there? And how do we keep ourselves from just totally getting wiped out by it and walking away? 
from the faith? How can you persevere in your faith regardless of how life pans out for you and regardless of what life throws at you? And so the text we're going to be looking at this morning is uh, in the book of Hebrews chapter 12. So if you have a Bible, uh, you're welcome to turn there with me. We're going to be looking at the first few verses of that. Um, and we're going to read it in just a second. But allow me to give you uh, just a little bit of context to what, what this book, it's a letter, uh, what this book, this letter is really about. So it's a letter that's written to Hebrew believers, Jewish believers of Jesus, and they. This is a community of, uh, of followers of Jesus that have come under difficult times, and they were experiencing significant pushback and scrutiny and persecution for their faith in Jesus. Their non-Christian neighbors are giving giving them uh, a bit of a hard time, and they're experiencing challenges and difficulties in their life that might even be causing them to question whether or not it's worth following Jesus at all. Do we want to do this anymore? Is it worth it? It's getting hard. It doesn't feel quite as warm and fuzzy as it used to. And so this letter, specifically, we're going to see in the the first part of uh, Hebrews chapter 12, is intended to energize and encourage them to stay vigilant in their faith regardless of what life was throwing at them. All right, so... Uh, what I want to do uh, before we really dig in and unpack it, I'm going to just begin. We're going we're gonna to read the first several verses throughout the morning, but I'm going to start by just reading you uh, verse 1 and 2 out loud, okay? So you can follow along with me uh, in your Bibles, or you can just uh, listen along. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Let us endure, let us persevere, let us keep the faith, regardless of what life is throwing at you. How do you do that? How do you keep the faith? The first thing is this, write this in your notes, is you recognize the pattern of faith. You recognize the pattern of faith. Look at the first part of verse 1. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. All right, so what we're going to see here uh, in in these few verses, we see this, this metaphor, this image being developed by the author of the book of Hebrews of... uh, of like the ancient Olympic games, all right? So we have like an arena, we have an amphitheater, and there are competitors that are competing, they're in a, in a contest competing for a prize. And in this image, in this, this uh, picture you're getting in your mind, the Christian, you and me, we are the competitors, we are the ones on the field. And, uh, but what we see here in this verse, there's an image of an amphitheater packed with rows and rows and rows of spectators. And that's what it means when it says that we are surrounded by a great cloud of people. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And these witnesses, they, they, they aren't just any random spectators. They just so happen to be the great heroes of faith. The great heroes of faith. How do I know that? Well, if you read chapter 11, the entire chapter before it, the whole chapter is dedicated to reminding this community of believers about these heroes of faith. And, uh, you know, it mentions... For instance, it mentions Noah, who built the ark to save his family from the flood. And even though he had no context for understanding what, what a flood like that would even look like or even mean, he, he by faith built the boat over the span of many, many, many years. Uh, and he obeyed God. And it talks about Abraham, who by faith answered God's call to leave his home. And he had no idea where he was going, but he went 
anyway because God said, I want you to go and I've got something good for you there. And then there's Abraham's wife, Sarah, who was, who was barren and who was really old, almost 100 years old. And by faith, she, she had a child. And it talks about Moses, who by faith, even though he grew up in Pharaoh's household, refused to associate with the Egyptian royal family. And instead, he chose to share in the oppression of God's people, the Hebrew people, and then deliver them out of Egypt through the Red Sea. Did all that by faith. It talks about Joshua and the armies of Israel and how they surrounded the walls of Jericho and it came crashing down. And it talks about many, many, many other people. I don't have the time to share them all with you this morning. But what I will say is, is that, that the scripture, it says this about these people, okay? It goes on and it says this about them. It says, by faith, these people, they overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back again from death. It's like, man, that's awesome. These are the witnesses. These are the people in the stands, right, in in my story. That's so cool. But it goes on. It says this. It says, but others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at, and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half. And others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith. And it's saying that the first thing we need to do is we need to look around and, and see that we, have, we, we are surrounded by this, this host of witnesses and spectators uh, in the arena of our journey of faith. And the question that we should be asking is, why does this matter? How does this help us? Why does this matter? Well, let me tell you this, is that one of the things that at least I have found, one of the main things that seems to test and apply pressure to our faith is challenging and painful circumstances. The storms of life. The storms of life, when we, when we go through them, man, they can wear down our faith when there's crushing circumstances or an uncertain future, sometimes we can begin to wonder whether or not our faith is really even working. And some of us can, can even get to the point where it's like, man, I've been faithfully following God. Why are things in my life getting harder and not easier? Maybe it's just not worth it anymore. And this might have even been the place that the, the Christians in the book of Hebrews were getting to. But in this verse, in Hebrews chapter 12, it's urging us to take notice of all the people of faith who have gone before us. Because when we do that, we'll notice that not a single man or woman has gained a seat in that great audience of faith without first passing through significant challenges, significant setbacks, and doubts, and fears, and pain, and problems, and some of them just an extraordinary amount of it. And so what the author of Hebrews, what he's doing by pointing out all these examples of the people of, with, who have had faith, what he's trying to do is he's trying to change our perspective. He's trying to change our perspective about our own struggles. He's trying to change our perspective about our own hardships and our own circumstances in life, the very circumstances that are testing and applying pressure to our faith. What he's saying is, hey, you're not the only one who suffers. You're not the only one who's struggling. Right? We see through their examples, the people who have gone before us through faith, we see through their examples that hardships that challenges, that trials, they are an inevitable part of the journey of faith. That there is an unavoidable pattern of faith that we all experience. There are times of blessings and celebration, but there are also times of trial and weeping. There are times where we 
clearly see God moving, but there are also times where we wonder if he's hearing our prayers at all. There are times where we're experiencing breakthroughs in our faith, but there are also times where we're feeling broken in our faith. And what what this passage is telling us is don't be surprised. This is part of the pattern of faith. There is a pattern in our journey of faith. And so when those hard times do come, we can take heart that we're not alone. We are in good company. Now, the question that I have is, is why in the world would God be cool with this? Why in the world would God be cool with this being like a normal part of the pattern of our journey of faith? And I think one of the big reasons is this, is that God would allow this to be an inevitable part of our journey of faith because it also happens to be incredibly advantageous for growing and persevering our faith. James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. Check this out in your notes. It says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. It's an odd way to describe your trials. Consider it pure joy when you face these trials. Why? Because you know that the testing of your faith, it produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. You see, in order to even get the perseverance, perseverance in your faith to begin with, you have to go through these things to get it. But for some, the, the challenges of life, it causes their faith to just come grinding to a halt. But, but for those with the right perspective who recognize that it's an opportunity to trust God to an even greater level, what it's going to do, it's going to produce in you even more momentum in your faith. It's going to produce in you even more intimacy with God. But you've got to be willing to let your perspective be shaped and be transformed and to trust. So if you want to persevere in your faith, you've got to recognize that you will experience real challenges and difficulty at some point in your journey, just as every other person of faith who has gone before you has. But you can also take heart that there is real meaning and purpose in them. They're not wasted. And if the great cloud of witnesses that surround us tell us anything, it's that trusting in God through the pain and the problems of life, it's, it's more than worth it. All right? So recognize the pattern of faith. The second thing is this, write this in. Avoid the pitfalls to your faith. Avoid the pitfalls to your faith. So the rest of verse 1, it says, Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So one of the most popular contests in the ancient Olympic Games was the foot race, okay? And uh, these, these runners were, were wildly popular, and people loved them. And uh, leading up to the games, the competitors, they would train. They would train super hard. With, through fierce training, they would, they would want to eliminate any excess weight that they might have gained, and for the race itself, what they would do is they would take off all the robes and they would chuck them on the side and they would run totally unclothed, which is one way to do it, I guess. But um, some of you guys don't appreciate that. So, but I, I totally understand. I mean, they didn't have the luxury of like Under Armour and the fancy spandex that, that runners wear today. And some of you guys wear that fancy spandex, whether you're a runner or not. That's cool. No judgment here. But uh, but without the luxury of that stuff, what option do you really have at the time, right? You got these like big robes and it would have been totally ridiculous to go sprinting in something like that, right? It's heavy. It would be dragging in the ground. It'd be like flapping around. It'd be like a sail, you know? And it'd be like tangling around their bodies and their legs. People would be like face planting. I would, I would pay to see a race like that, wouldn't you? Now that's interesting. Let them wear the robes. So Hebrews 12, it's using this imagery to show us what it, what it looks like to endure in our faith. And now what the scripture is doing, it's turning the spotlight and aiming it at our inner life, at our attitudes, at our decisions, 
at our behavior, at the sin that undermines our faith. And there are two aspects to this, okay? We see in this verse here, two aspects to this. First is to lay aside every weight. Lay aside every weight. So this is the image of a competitor training to lose excess weight and get lean in preparation for the big day of the race. Right? How many of you know that your ability to persevere and keep your faith will, in large part, be a direct result of how disciplined you are in exercising your faith. I'm going to say that one more time. Your ability to persevere and keep your faith will be a direct result of how disciplined you are in exercising your faith. We see... We see talk of this all over scripture. I'll just, I'll just name a few. It's not in your notes, but like 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the apostle Paul says, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. And again, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, he says, train yourself in godliness for while physical training is of some value, godliness is valuable in every way, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. It's like, look at we see even the, the athletes who are, who are training for a physical prize, they got to do it. How much more do you think you got to do it in your spiritual life? You know, I, I started playing ice hockey when I was around three years old. And uh, I played for, for quite a long time, all the way through high school. And I, I played competitive hockey, which means that I, I traveled like all around the country and Canada. And I got to play against teams from like all over the world. Uh, and so... Uh, sometimes people will hear that I play ice hockey and they ask like, hey, Tim, are you good? And what I tell them is I used to be good. And, I'm, and, and I, don't, I don't say that just to like be modest with a false sense of modesty or something like that. I really mean that I used to be good. You see, a couple of years ago, someone got me to join a men's league up here in Ashburn. And uh, it was the first organized league I'd played in in over 10 years. And literally within the first three minutes of the first game, I thought I was going to die. Like, I thought I, thought I was going to die. I was almost like, do they have my emergency contact? You know, like, I couldn't breathe. My legs were shaking. You know, I was just like, should I be sweating this much? I don't know, right? Like, it's just, it was, it was crazy. And I left that game thinking, like, man, what did I expect? Did I expect to be like, you know, the same, like, 18-year-old Tim, like, throwing down. It was just, like, it was so frustrating. Like, my brain would tell my body to do things, and my body wouldn't do it. Have you guys ever experienced that before? I'd, like, have the puck, and my brain would, like, send a signal saying, shoot puck now. And be like, 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000. Ugh. I was like, wow. Right? I used to be good. Because when I was good, I played and I trained like most days out of the week, year round. But since I stopped, I stopped completely. I just, I just don't have the same kind of strength. I don't have the same kind of stamina. And I shouldn't even expect to. I mean, I'm barely hanging on when I play now. I mean, an athlete can't expect to stay on top of his or her game if they don't stay disciplined and devote time and energy to training. And we can't expect to maintain a strong faith if we don't use it. If we don't stay disciplined, if we don't take it seriously, if we don't devote time and energy to worship our great God who allowed us to run the race in the first place, to devote time in prayer and in reading the word of God, which is life-giving words. And if we don't take Christ-centered community seriously and spend time with people that, that love us and want to know us and want to pray for us and want to support us, and if we don't spend time serving others and thinking about other people and how we can help them and fill their needs... Right, if we stop making these things a priority in our life, we'll find very little strength and stamina to persevere in our faith. Why? Well, without spiritual discipline, you're going to start putting on some needless weight. 
that's going to hold you back. What I mean is that if you don't spend time in the wisdom and counsel of God's word and in the intimacy of worship and the power of prayer and the encouragement of community, don't be surprised if you start carrying around a little more uncertainty than you once did. Don't be surprised when you start carrying around some excess insecurity about who you are in Christ. And don't be surprised if you start carrying around a few extra desires that weren't quite as strong before. Or a little extra doubt, a little extra fear about your circumstances. And you may, you may not notice it right away. You might, you might not notice the extra pounds, but weight gain can sometimes be subtle. If you neglect discipline in your faith, you'll start carrying some extra baggage and it'll make the race of faith harder than it needs to be. So if you want any chance of persevering in your faith, it's, it's time to get serious. That's what the scripture is saying here. It's time to get serious. It's time to lay aside every weight. But there's more. The other part of this verse, it says to lay aside the sin which clings so closely. And this is the image of a runner throwing off his robe so, so nothing hinders him while he runs. And uh, the original Greek language in this verse uh, seems to suggest that clings so closely, to, to, for it to cling closely, it suggests that it's something that's familiar to you, right? So it's a sin that you might be kind of familiar with. It's, it, you know, we all have certain things in our life that seem to be a, a particular weakness for us. Things that we have to keep battling, things that keep making their way into our life. And every single one of us needs to be aware of the familiar yet subtle sin that entangles itself in our life and make a point of ripping it out. And that's possible by the power of Jesus Christ. We all got things, pride, greed, lust, addiction, selfishness, gossip, bitterness, resentment. If we don't stay on top of it, these things can wrap around our life like a parasite without us even being aware of it. And they'll render us immobile in our faith. They'll prevent us from moving forward. They'll prevent us from growing. They'll interfere with our relationship with God. They'll interfere with our relationship with the people that, that love us most. And it'll make it difficult for us to discern God's spirit and his will for our life. And so let's just use this moment before we move on. Let's just use this moment to consider what's the robe that you need to toss off in order to run the race? What's entangling itself in your life? What's interfering with your ability to have a healthy relationship with God and with other people? It's time to take it off. It's time to throw it aside. It's only slowing you down. It's only holding you back. You know, when I... During those years that I played hockey, uh, some of our coaches, they, they wanted everybody on the team to take kind of like a health pledge in order to be on the team. So if you wanted to be on the team, you had to take a pledge that you would uh, kind of take care of your bodies, right? So uh, there was no uh, drugs allowed or drinking allowed, which are kind of like the obvious ones. But also, uh, there was no like drinking soda. There was no like candy and junk food and stuff like that. And uh, the idea was like you, you, that the coaches wanted, wanted the players to keep away from anything that would affect our performance on the ice. And this is kind of the bottom line of Hebrews chapter 12 here. Where it's saying avoid anything that could hinder your faith in any way whether it be a blatant sin or just something that's unhelpful. It's saying go to the greatest lengths possible to make your heart and make your mind spiritually lean and fit and ready to run the race. Third thing is this, concentrate on the power for faith. Concentrate on the power for faith. Hebrews 12, 
verse 2 through 3. Uh, look at this verse with me. It says, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. And so uh, these verses, they continue to build on that image of, a, of an awesome race, of an awesome contest. And uh, uh, so a Greek stadium was an oblong area. It was a little more than 600 feet long. And, and if you were going to look at it, the starting point, the starting place for the runners was at the entrance of the stadium. And at the opposite end was the finish line, was the goal. And uh, at the end, at the finish line, sat the judge of the race. And what he held in his hands and in his lap was the prize. And the key to victory for the competitors of the race was to keep their eyes fixed on him. When they lined up at the starting line and as they ran down the lane, they kept their eyes on the judge and on that sweet prize that he was holding. And so with us, the key to flourishing in our faith is fixing our eyes on the example and the inspiration and the originator and the source of power for our faith, the righteous judge, Jesus Christ. This is the key. Without this, you will not finish. In the race of faith, we move our mind and we move our thoughts over to Jesus because well, he's the ultimate example and inspiration for how to run it, especially when it comes to running it at a high cost. I mean, think about this. It's like being taught how to play a sport by the person who invented it. Why would you not want to concentrate on that? I love how the message translation of the Bible writes these same verses. It says, keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God, he could put up with anything along the way. Cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God. When you find yourselves flagging in your faith, go over that story item by item, that long litany of hostility he plowed through. That will shoot adrenaline into your souls. In those moments where we're flailing in our faith a little bit, our focus on Jesus, what it'll do, it'll remind us how to press forward. It'll remember why it's worth it to press forward. And ultimately, it will infuse us with the strength to press forward. But the problem is that sometimes we let our focus wander, don't we? We let our focus wander around. Sometimes we start looking at all the stuff around us, right? We start getting focused on what's happening around, the circumstances around us. We get distracted by everything going on around here and veer off course. And sometimes we start watching the people around us. We start worrying about how well I compare to the guy next to me and we worry about how well I measure up to the woman over here and are they further along in their faith? Are they, you know, what do they do? How do I measure up? What are they doing right and what am I doing wrong? Right, these are distractions. It'll do nothing more than to trip us, off, trip, trip us up and take us off course. And Jesus is telling us, keep your eyes on me. It doesn't matter what's going on around you. It doesn't matter what's flying around, what obstacles around here. It doesn't even matter who you're competing against. It doesn't matter how far along they are on the course. What matters is that you're looking at me and that you're coming at me and you're moving forward. That's all that matters. And in fact, you know what Jesus says? I don't even care how fast you're going. Finishing well has nothing to do with how fast you are moving. He just wants you to move. Move forward. Even if you got to take baby steps, just move. It doesn't matter if you've got like Usain Bolt next to you. Like, let him go. Cheer him on, Usain, right? Like, you just move and keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Don't get distracted. And probably one of the more One of the other ways that we lose our focus is that sometimes 
we assume that the only way to finish well in our faith is to focus on our own performance as a Christian. So sometimes we're not focused on our circumstances. Sometimes we're not focused on the people around us, but sometimes we're just focused here. You know what I mean? We're focused on my behavior and how well I'm doing and my performance as a Christian. We fixate on our own strength and on our own talent and on our own wisdom, on our own credentials. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how lean and fit and strong and well-prepared you think you are for the race. It's only Jesus that will get you to the finish line. Can I get an amen from somebody? So you need to look beyond yourself. Regardless of how much of the Bible you have memorized, regardless of how much Bible school you have attended, regardless of how long you've been attending church, how many small groups you've mastered, look beyond yourself and concentrate on the one where real power for faith comes from, Jesus Christ. We can also get distracted by letting our eyes wander away from Jesus and placing too much focus on a spiritual leader or a pastor or a preacher or a church, perhaps even without even realizing it, right? That, that sometimes our faith comes to rely more on a person or on a church or a program rather than the God that they serve, right? Like sometimes there are people who won't show up to church because their favorite preacher isn't preaching, are they here to hear the guy or the word of God? Or sometimes if, if a, a ministry goes away, or if a person goes away, then our faith goes with them. We constantly, and it, 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 again, it is fine to like be all about our church and all about our pastor. That's great. We should. We should su support those things. We should get behind them. We should root them on. We should believe in them. But we need to ask ourselves if, if this question, that if all of a sudden, if I all of a sudden no longer had access to this person or that church or that ministry, would my faith not only still be okay, but be positioned well to grow? Will my faith still grow if those things are no longer in my life? On who or on what does your faith rest? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 through 5 in your notes. It says this. The Apostle Paul says, When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message, my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. So that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. He's saying don't anchor your faith to a person or a preacher or to a church. Anchor it to God. Why? Because the things of this world, you, you do not owe your, the, your faith does not owe its origin to the things of this world. Your faith does not owe its continuation to the things of this world. The faith that we have and the faith that we hope to grow is literally only possible with the help of Jesus. He is, as Hebrews 12 reminds us, the very one who created the race of faith we're in to begin with. And if we need him to get started, we need him to finish. He is the source of power for our faith. Last point is this. Fourth point, remember my position in faith. Remember my position in faith. Hebrews 12, verse 5 through 7. It says, have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when... Reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? So I think maybe a lot of us, we hear the word discipline a lot in this passage, and we, we immediately think of discipline in terms of like our, you know, modern world and how we punish kids when they mess up, right? It's all about when the kids mess up, we put them in timeout or whatever, whatever your method is. But this is not totally that, right? The Greek word for discipline here could easily also be translated to train your child, instruct your child, 
educate your child. All right, so let me give you an example here. So uh, for those of you who have kids, do your kids get bored and let you know that they're bored ever? Because mine do a lot. Right? And our house is full of arts and crafts and games and toys and all that stuff. And it's like literally they'll sit down with something and like five seconds later they'll come, come on over and like they're, they're bored. They want something new. And, you know, sometimes I'll just let them be bored. You know, I don't feel like I need to rush over to them and constantly be, be filling their, their lap with things to do and making them instantly happy. Sometimes I'll just let them be bored. Sometimes they get frustrated and I'll let them work through their frustrating situation without rushing in to save them from it. Sometimes, or a lot of times, I won't say yes. I don't say yes to everything they ask for, even though they'd be super excited about it in the moment if I did. And the reason why I do all those things is because I love them. They're my kids. And while I, love, I would love nothing more than for them to be happy all the time, I know that sometimes their equilibrium of contentment and comfort needs to be tilted a little in order to teach them and prepare them to be well-adjusted, emotionally balanced, mature human beings. Now you are God's child. This is saying, have you forgotten that you are a child of God? If you follow Jesus, you are God's son. You are God's daughter. And out of his wildly abundant love for you, he will not always rush in to protect you from those moments when your faith is flailing. He will not just rush in to, to save you from those things and circumstances that are testing and challenging and shaking your faith. And you might be in a place in your faith where you're feeling just sort of like, bleh. You know, it's just like, nah kind of like a dry spell. Maybe you're just not feeling it. And maybe you're beginning to wonder why God doesn't just come to the rescue and give you a shot of hallelujah. <laughs> God, I know you can do it. Make me feel good, right? And I'll tell you why he doesn't. Because God cares too much about you and your faith to just come in, rush in and spoon feed you a dose of feel goods whenever your fire fades. And you might say, well, I thought you said I'm God's child. Yeah, but that doesn't mean God prefers you and me to be childish. God, out of his fatherly love for us, he's trying to teach us to be strong and courageous and faithful and spiritually mature followers of Christ who are full of God's wisdom and the spirit of his will. He wants us to be level-headed, spirit-discerning, scripture-following, God-fearing children who can navigate the brokenness and unpredictability of this fallen world without getting seduced or crushed by it. He's training us. It's a gift. And I know it doesn't feel good, but by the way, just because he's not rushing in to save you doesn't mean he's walked away and abandoned you. He's there. He's not going to let you get completely crushed by it. This is an opportunity for him to bring your faith to the next level. And in fact, some might say that it would be irresponsible and unloving of a parent to just constantly give the child all the things that they're constantly asking for without giving them an opportunity to struggle and grow and learn. 1 John 3, 1, it says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. We need to remember who we are. We are children, and God treats us as children. So if you're in a rough spot in your faith right now, there's good news. You're loved. And like a good father trying to train his child, I want you to understand this. He is so, so patient and gracious with your progress. Don't be so hard on yourself. I feel like maybe some of you are too hard on yourself. Just keep trusting in God in this season. 
and know that he has not only not given up on you, but he's watching you going, man, that's my boy. That's my girl. And just know that if you trust in him through the struggles of faith, he will not only see you through it, but he will work things in you that will completely change your life. That will completely change your life. Man, you guys can come on up. So now that you know what the pattern of faith really looks like, now that you know you got to avoid those pitfalls to your faith, now that you know that finishing well depends on how well you focus on Jesus, the power for your faith, now that you know your position in faith, that you are a child of God and have the creator of the universe training you up and cheering you on, this segment of scripture, it finishes with verse 12 and 13. Look at it on the screen. It says, therefore, lift your drooping hands, strengthen your weak knees, make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Whatever happens, however you feel, whatever circumstance comes your way, whatever news you wake up to in the morning, whatever stress or fear or doubt tries to invade your home, don't stop believing. You may get worn out, but you got to resolve to pick up those tired, slack hands because we're not giving up. Mm -mm. You've come too far and there's too much at stake. And your knees may be shaking and your legs may feel powerless, but get those feet out of the dirt. Because God is calling us to get moving. We're not stopping here. Do you know why? Because the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. You know, it's funny, that story I told you uh, at the very beginning about that, that person who made that comment, you know, they actually became a, a, a dear friend of Lindsay and I. In fact, I ended up officiating her wedding. And... Many years later, we were having a conversation with this person, and do you know what she said? She said, you proved my theory wrong. She said, you proved my theory wrong. And do you know what we told her? In your face. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Didn't expect that one, did you? Oh, man, we celebrated. We celebrated how good God is. And we're celebrating because do you know why? She was at the best place that she had ever been in terms of her relationship with Jesus. Years and years, over 10 years later, this is like, she had never been more in love with Jesus. She had never been more passionate about Jesus. She had never seen God moving so clearly in such an amazing ways, right? It's possible. You just got to keep moving forward. You just got to keep moving. Heavenly Father God, we just thank you, Lord, that you have put us in this race. Just being in this race is a gift. And God, this morning, we... We just proclaim that we are not going to rely on our performance. We're not going to rely on our best efforts. We're not going to rely on our strength. We're going to rely on your grace to get us to the finish line. Why? Because your grace is sufficient for us. And regardless of what happens around us, the obstacles that we may face along the way, we will not be shaken for our heart remains steadfast, trusting in you. Thank you, Lord, that you provide us with the opportunities to grow. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunities to learn, to be stretched, to be taken out of our comfort zone. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunities to trust you to a greater level. Lord, we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith the beginning and the end of our faith. He is the originator and the perfecter of our faith. 
God, we've got our eyes on you. Would you draw us in and bring us home? In Jesus' name we pray.